We go now to Shai Feldman. He's a politics professor at Brandeis University and the director of its Crown Center for Middle East Studies. He's joining us now from Waltham, Massachusetts. Professor, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, first of all, I think the big question in everyone's minds now is what happens next? We know the military has now taken over. Do you have confidence from what you have seen in the Middle East that there will be indeed a transition and a peaceful one to democracy? No, I think that uh, the situation right now really uh, opens more questions than answers. First of all, uh, the president, uh, Mubarak, took a very interesting step of abdicating uh, in favor uh, of the Supreme Military Council and not in favor of the vice president. So that first of all opens the question of who rules Egypt uh, right now. And if it, if it is the Supreme Military Council, can a country the size of Egypt with the problems that Egypt has uh, be ruled by, by a committee essentially? So that's the first problem that you have. And the second problem that you have is in trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. Uh, who exactly will the Supreme Military Council negotiate with? And the real problem is that the protesters are divided. They're not, they don't have a, a recognized leadership. And so who exactly will they negotiate uh, this transition with? And of course, the third is the irony of a Supreme Military Council ha uh, being in charge of transitioning to democracy that uh, with, of course, a, a group of people that have no experience and have not had an experience with democracy in their life. How this will happen, I think, is, uh, opens many more questions than answers. Do you think that the jubilation that we're seeing the protesters express is misplaced, that the military will, in fact, uh, sort of submit to democratic uh, system there in Egypt? Well, I, it's, it's mis I mean, I can understand the, the jubilation, and if I were in Tahrir Square right now, I would probably be, get caught up in it. Uh, myself, but as I said, I think the situation right now is, is extremely uncertain as to where this would lead, uh, and, it, and, and indeed it could lead into all sorts of different directions. I also want to point out that structurally, the, uh, this asymmetry between the protesters, the pro-democracy that is leaderless, mm -hmm. and the two, the two institutions, you have two strong institutions. That, okay. are, that are there. One is the right. military that has taken over. And Professor, before the break, uh, you were starting to talk about sort of the institutions that uh, now are players in Egypt and, and that the protest movement has been somewhat disorganized up until now. So when the military sits down at the table, as presumably they will do, who will be on the other side of the table? Will the Muslim Brotherhood be there? Will Mohammed al baradei be there? Who, who are the other individuals who are going to be at play? Well, that is the big question. Um, the Muslim Brothers uh, are there. Uh, they're very careful not to seem to be at the front of this. They've uh, been very careful to say they will not field the candidate in the September elections. But they're, the, but they're except for the army, they're the only other strong institution uh, in Egypt. And uh, it, it's not at all clear that Muhammad al baradei has any significant following within Egypt. So that, that of course, uh, keeps the question very much open. And which is the reason why um, the, the end of Mubarak doesn't necessarily immediately mean the end of the regime. And what about some of the other sort of political figures that, and business figures in Egypt who have been sort of uh, floating around on, on the fringes as all this has been going on? Well, I think the most important impact as far as business and uh, the economy is concerned is that I think that Mubarak's uh, resignation will now shift the balance between the protesters and those who have already been saying, look, we have achieved a large chunk of what we were out to achieve. Now we have to go back to, to business. Now we have to, back to go back to our normal lives. We have 35 million Egyptians that make less than $2 a day. We have an economy that's, that's dependent on tourism for its, for, for its hard currency, where the tourism industry for now is dead. So I think the balance now will shift uh, in favor of those who say, look, we've, we've, we've got what we wanted. Now let this process play out. Now let's go, go, back, go back to work. I think the, the, the balance now will shift between Tahrir Square and all the other neighborhoods of Cairo, which, where there are 14 other million Egyptians, let alone the other cities of Egypt. Uh, just quickly here, what does the country now need to do economically, besides obviously open up the tourism industry again, what does it need to do to, to move forward? Just quickly here. 
Well, very quickly, it, first of all, it has to, the, the banking system has to begin operating because it's a cash, it's a cash based economy. So people need cash to buy in the shops. Uh, right now, the shops are open, but, but uh, a few people have the cash to, to buy what they need. But I mean, going forward beyond that, under a new government, what measures does it need to take? Well, it has to stabilize, and the question then it will have to do with this, with the, with the confidence that people will have that there is a that there is a clear roadmap between now and September. What this transition would look like, what exact changes in the constitution uh, will be acceptable, and, and so on and so forth. Which then, unfortunately, takes us back to the question of with who will the military council right. negotiate these changes, and that's not entirely clear at the moment. All right, Shai Feldman of Brandeis University, thank you so much for joining us and for your insight on the Egyptian situation. Appreciate it.